You may be seated. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we are gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Jerry Sullivan. We come together in grief. We acknowledge our human loss. And so may God grant us peace and grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. I invite you to bow your heads in prayer. O God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I count it a very great privilege and an honor to be part of this service because of all of you, I'm probably the one who knew Jerry the least actual amount of time. Um, I've only been Jerry's pastor, Jerry and David's pastor, since July of last year. And in particular, I was very, very shocked and saddened to learn of Jerry's uh, passing. In fact, it was just a few days before then when I had gone by to visit Jerry um, when I heard that He was moving into hospice care, and I went by the house, and Jerry was not there, but David was. Um, Jerry was getting a blood transfusion, and we talked for a while, and um, I just assumed that I was going to come back a few days later and have some time to talk to Jerry. And so we talked about when a good time would be to come back, and we talked instead about how David was doing, and I was just utterly devastated when, just a few days later, I got the text message that he had already gone on, and I feel like it's a terrible loss for me. I wrote about uh, Jerry in the church newsletter last week because one of the things I thought about was the very first email that Jerry wrote me. It was not long after I had started at the church, and Jerry just wanted to share some of his concerns and, um, and encouragements to me as the new pastor, and so I asked if you just let me read a small excerpt from that email because it gives us gives me some real insight into who Jerry was. He wrote, I've become concerned that we might be losing some emphasis on the folks who walk in our doors each week. I know that many of them are hurting and come to be nurtured in some way. I look across our congregation and see aging seniors, people facing illnesses, single mothers, and countless visitors. I worry that we are not attending to them. Before joining the choir, David and I tried our best to greet visitors and welcome them, but having only been members for about six months, we often didn't know who the new folks were. In the community prayer, we often pray for large issues in the world, but I feel like I'm missing knowing how to pray for our church members. From time to time, a name may be mentioned, but I don't really know what they are facing or how to pray for them. I feel like we only really know what has happened when someone passes away. There may be things we can do for folks or offer to them if we know that better. I'm feeling like we could use some dose of community in our services or our congregation. I believe when I got this email from Jerry, I don't think at that point I even knew 
that Jerry himself was suffering from cancer. And so it only occurred to me a little bit later that Jerry was speaking out of his own very deep need and concern. That he himself had become a part of the congregation here because he himself needed to be nurtured. He needed to be attended to. And so because of his own pain that he had experienced, he was especially acute uh, and especially sensitive to other people who might be sitting in the pews beside him who were also in pain or suffering or hurting. And that's why I suggested in the newsletter that I think Jerry had a pastor's heart. And in fact, I'll even be so bold to say if Jerry had been born in a different day and time, he very well may have been encouraged to go into the ministry and to be a pastor, because he would have been a great pastor. He had, in my mind, the pastor's heart, the special set of skills and gifts and sensitivity that makes someone a great pastor. He also reminded me, this also reminded me of a book that had a lot of influence on me when I was learning to be a pastor, a small book called The Wounded Healer by a Catholic priest named Henry Nowen. And the introduction to the book, in the introduction to the book, Nowen says this, and I think this speaks to why Jerry himself was such a particularly effective minister. Nowen says, For all ministers are called to recognize the sufferings of their times in their own hearts and make that recognition the starting point of their service. Whether we try to enter into a dislocated world, relate to a convulsive generation, or speak to a dying person, our service will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from a heart wounded by the suffering about which we are to speak. I think what made Jerry a particularly effective healer is that he had his own wounds. And he knew and was in touch with his own pain, his own fears. When I thought of a scripture that I could read, um, I chose one that you're going to think is a little odd. But I'm going to read it anyway. It's just a couple of verses. And it comes, appropriately enough in this season, it comes right after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus has been raised from the dead. And he appears to his disciples on uh, the beach, on the seaside, and he has breakfast with them. And so I just want to read John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. There's a very simple point to this passage. Three times Jesus asks Peter to feed the sheep, feed his sheep. What does it mean to feed the sheep? Now, excuse me as I get a little bit preacherly here on you. But I want to try to explain what it means to feed the sheep. First of all, it means to know the sheep. You have to know the sheep in order to feed them. You have to know what their hopes and dreams are, what their needs are, what their concerns are, what their pain is. You have to know what it is that motivates them and what it is they dream about and what it is that they're afraid of the most. And I know that in his life and in his own ministry, Jerry was the kind of person who knew the sheep. He wanted to get to know people. And he was very concerned that our church knew the people, knew the sheep. To say, feed my sheep, means that we step in and we give care once we know what the needs are. And I think Jerry was fortunate in that he had a job in which he was able to do this on a regular basis. 
he was able to work and go to work in a field in which he knew that what he was doing was helping and making a difference and caring. He was able to live this out. And to feed the sheep means to have compassion on the sheep, to have compassion. Jerry was certainly a compassionate person, and he wanted to be a person who showed compassion, and he wanted our church to be a place that showed compassion. I believe Jerry took these words of Jesus very, very seriously. I believe he took this as a mandate. I think he saw this as a mission, to feed Christ's sheep. And I say that because I think Jerry was in a unique position to do that very thing himself. He knew how to help feed the sheep because he himself was someone who was hungry and who had been in pain and experienced wounding and had experienced suffering. But instead of curling up in a ball and wishing it would all go away and moaning his fate, he instead took seriously Jesus' words and he fed the sheep. So today I believe Jerry challenges each of us to reach out to others. To feed Christ's sheep even though we ourselves may be deeply in pain at that moment. To feed Christ's sheep, even though we may be afraid of being around other people's pain. To feed Christ's sheep, even though we may ourselves feel like we're one of the hungry sheep. To feed Christ's sheep, even though we ourselves are full of grief. Thanks be to God who feeds us and empowers us to feed others. And thanks be to God for the life and the ministry of Jerry Sullivan. Amen.
is John Seibert, the President and Chief Operating Officer of City Square. I joined City Square in August of 2012 after nearly 10 years of preaching at the Richardson East Church of Christ in Richardson, Texas. When Jerry heard that his new boss was a Church of Christ minister, <laughs> let's just say he was more than a bit concerned. <laughs> Much to his delight, I've always been an epic failure as a Church of Christ person. <laughs> I've never let the teachings of our tradition uh, obscure my belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I actually like Jerry. <laughs> he wasn't used to that because in plain view, Church of Christ people would send you to hell for being a Baptist. So he was pretty sure his being gay was going to mean I thought he was not on God's team. But I liked Jerry, and I accepted Jerry, and I affirmed Jerry, and he did the same for me. And together he and I took leadership roles at City Square at the same time. And we partnered together. And it was a privilege and an honor to work with him every day. And as our friendship grew, he quit calling me John or Sir and gave me a term of endearment. He called me Boss. And every time I saw him, he'd say, hey, boss. Boss, let me tell you about something, boss. And then I would get emails. Boss, need to just run something by you. And I returned the favor. I called Jerry my guy. That's my guy. That's the guy I believe in. That's the guy that gets things done around here. That's the guy I trust. Jerry was my guy. We had a great friendship blossom. And I loved having Jerry as a member of the City Square team. Jerry was an ambassador for all we hope and claim to be as an organization. Jerry was a living, breathing, walking, best practice model. It was care for foster youth done right. It was city square done right. It was community, stewardship, faith, justice in its best possible expression. That was the day with Jerry Sullivan. He was not good at his job. He was great at his job. He was masterful. He loved youth deeply, and he coached and equipped and nurtured his staff like only a natural-born leader can. Jerry was a great storyteller and advocate for track and for the youth that he served. And that dude was a fundraising gold mine. <laughs> he could raise money. Especially because about three sentences into a story about a youth, every time, not sometimes, not most of the time, every time, Jerry would get the clip to <laughs> And you knew it was coming and but it wouldn't derail the story. He was masterful at being able to talk through his tears. And before every site visit with United Way, he'd say, boss, I'm not going to cry this time. <laughs> Come on, Jerry. We all know we're three sentences away from the waterworks. <laughs> Another one of Jerry's spiritual gifts was that he could bitch without being bitchy. <laughs> kind of like your email, Wes. Um, 
He had it down to an art form. And I loved this about Jerry. I trusted this. I knew Jerry had my back. And I knew Jerry was not going to BS me. I was going to know what he needed. I was going to know what he needed that he was not getting. And sometimes I would even know from whom he was not getting it from. (laughs) But he could do it with the right tone and the right attitude that let me know he was on my team and he had my back and he just wanted what was best for City Square and for his team and most importantly for the youth that we care about so deeply. I relied on Jerry's sincere, honest, open feedback because I knew it made me better and it made us better. And Jerry had a soft, squishy, compassionate heart. It's one of the biggest hearted people I have ever known. But just because he had a soft heart did not mean Jerry Sullivan was soft. He was tough and strong. And he stood up for what he believed in. And he stood up for goodness and truth consistently. He expected it of himself and he expected it of others. And don't go messing with his team. And definitely do not screw with his kids. Because he had a look. He didn't have to go because it was right in here. And his eyes could show you the way of the Lord more fully. (laughs) But that authentic, sincere goodness and commitment to truth and to justice made us all better. Jerry loved track and the track youth as though they were his own flesh and blood. He was a poster child what each of us at City Square wants to be. He was my friend and my teacher, my brother in Christ. I didn't just like Jerry Sullivan. I absolutely love that guy. And I will miss him deeply. Months ago, Jerry and I just started giving each other that look. We didn't even have to say a word. We just knew his battle with cancer was not going well. And so one day, we had a talk about having the talk. And I just told him, Jerry, you're driving the ship. And you're going to call the shots. But if it gets to the point that we need to talk about what if, you let me know. He said, it's getting close, boss. I'll let you know. And a few weeks later, it was time for the talk. And I went to Jerry's office. We closed the door. And we cried together. And he used the word sucked as a noun, verb, and adjective. And as he would in his dependable and conscientious self, he wanted to talk about how things should go at track if he weren't around anymore and make sure he had taken care of everybody. And we had that conversation. And I told him, Jerry, you have my word that everything in me will make sure track has a future that honors your legacy. And that kids will be loved on as you've taught us how to love on. And then he just talked about how much cancer sucks. (laughs) And how much he regretted that he and I weren't going to get to spend years working together. 
and growing our friendship. How much he missed having a glass of wine because of the stupid chemo. How much he did not want to die. How much he really still wanted to live. And we were unanimous that, yeah, this hand you're being dealt, it sucks. But we also found joy and cherished the gift of knowing one another and the gift of Jerry's life. And he was so thankful for the work he had been able to do and for the team he had assembled, for the capable hands that he would leave his youth with. And most of all, David, he was so proud of the love you two shared. And he talked about that being the greatest gift of his life. He cherished you so much and was so thankful for your love. And then Jerry said, John, you're the best boss I've ever had. And I need to ask you, when the time comes, if you will do my eulogy. Are you willing to do that? And I said, Jerry, that's, that's not a have to, man. That's a get to. That's a privilege. And I would be honored to do that for you. Typical Jerry. In a conversation about his death, he uses it to bless my life. It's appropriate that we gather to celebrate Jerry's life and that in that celebration we find joy and even laughter. Because Jerry was one of the funniest, smartest, most exuberant, joyful people I ever met. He lived and he loved deeply. And while I know he's glad we've laughed some today and he wants us to laugh some more, I know he would want me to be honest and claim my truth. So here it goes, Jerry. I'm here today under protest. This is not where I want to be. I want to be drinking glasses of wine and singing karaoke with Jerry Sullivan. (laughs) It's not okay with me that such a beautiful and wonderful life is snuffed out after over only 44 years. And so I will celebrate his life, but I also want to acknowledge our loss because it's a big one. So for the last few weeks, I've been pouring myself a glass of red wine in Jerry's honor at night. And more often than not, I find myself reciting the words of a poem by Edna St. Vincent Millay, entitled Dirge Without Music. I am not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts into the hard ground. So it is and so it will be, for so it has been, time out of mind. Into the darkness they go, the wise and the lovely. Crowned with lilies and with laurel they go, but I am not resigned. Lovers and thinkers into the earth with you, be one with the dull, the indiscriminate dust, a a fragment of what you felt, of what you knew, a formula, a phrase remains, but the best is lost. The answer's quick and keen, the honest look, the laughter, the love, they are gone. Gone to feed the roses. Elegant and curled is the blossom, fragrant is the blossom, I know. 
but I do not approve. More precious was the light in your eyes than all the roses in the world. Down, down, down. Into the darkness of the grave, gently they go, the beautiful, the tender, the kind. Quietly they go, the intelligent, the witty, the brave. I know. But I do not approve. And I am not resigned. Our beloved Jerry's gone. But we do not approve. And we are not resigned. This is a tragic loss. A deep loss. A loss that I don't fully know how to recover from. There's a part of me that thinks I can do God's job better than God. And that part is saying, God, you screwed this one up. Your mission of rest restoration throughout the world, your mission, God, of the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, your mission of life and love, it takes a step back when you lose a servant like Jerry Sullivan. He was doing good work in bringing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. He was an embodiment, an ambassador of God's life and God's love. And so if I had a vote, Jerry would be alive, still living and serving as the pastor and the lover of people that he was. So it's in the midst of that grief and that loss that I find myself having to grab hold of our faith even more tightly. I'm thankful for reminders like Easter, which remind us that the worst things are never the last things. That the Friday of Jesus' death is always followed by the Sunday of Jesus' resurrection. The cross does not get the last word. The empty tomb does. Death never has the final say. Death is not the last chapter in the story. And in the midst of our grief and our loss... I find renewed joy and hope in knowing that all cancer did was kill Jerry's body. But Jerry's heart and soul, the love that exuded from Jerry's life, lives on. And it will never die. The love that Jerry has poured out on you and me and on countless others will echo throughout eternity. When Jerry told me he was going into hospice care, I told him that my prayer for him was that he would have time to cash in his investments. Jerry was one of the richest people I ever met. And he had a really diversified portfolio. He invested in all sorts of people. In every season of his life. He invested in priceless things. In things so much more valuable than money. And I prayed that he would see the richness of those investments that the love that he had shown so many others would be poured out upon him. In the Gospel of John, there's this focus on what it means to live out and embody the love of God and to put flesh on God's love. And that gets continued in the book of 1 John 
where John tells us, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is perfected in us. Jerry's life preached this sermon. It proclaimed this text. He loved us the way that God loves us. He loved us the way that God loves him. And there are hundreds, probably countless thousands of young people who have never seen the love of God in action until they met Jerry Sullivan. And because of his willingness to love them as God loves them, they were able to discover for the first time in their lives who they really are. Children of God. When nothing else and no one else would tell them the truth about who they are, Jerry did. In the midst of dark, ugly, painful realities, in the midst of neglect and abuse and destruction, in the midst of lies and deceit, Jerry was light in the darkness. He was God's instrument of restoration to bind up the broken and heal the wounded. His love was true. True enough to drown out the lies. Perhaps this is the reason more than any other that I love Jerry Sullivan. Because when I was around him, I found it easier to believe that maybe God still loved me. And there are days when I struggle to believe. And there are times when the painful realities of the work that we do at City Square test my hope. There are times when I wonder... If God's love will carry the day. And if God's ministry of restoration and reconciliation will ever come to pass. Sometimes I doubt that God's kingdom will ever come on earth as it is in heaven. But oh, when I spent time with my guy. Jerry's life strengthened my faith. He helped me believe. He renewed my hope. He gave me courage and strength to keep fighting the good fight. Sometimes when I wasn't sure if I was still on God's team, I knew at least I was on Jerry's team. And he'd get me back to God's team. Our team is playing hurt now. So each of us will have to step up. Each of us will need to leave this place today prepared to be more joyful and to love more freely and to give more deeply. To find a bit more joy, to show a bit more love, to drink a bit more wine and always be willing to love those who need it the most. In this way, we will honor our friend Jerry and the love that he displayed among us 
will be carried on and echo throughout eternity. Jerry loved to sing. When he was in high school choir in Plainview, he had a dear friend named Melissa McCormick Brockman. When she heard about his death, she contacted the high school choir director, Mr. Walter Wright. In the days following Jerry's death, Mr. Wright conducted and recorded the Plainview a cappella choir singing, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. In just a minute, we're going to hear that recording. But first, I want to say one last thing about our dear friend. Jerry embraced his death with the same courage and grace and faith with which he lived. And so the end of his days remind me much of the Apostle Paul's, who said to his young protege Timothy as he was preparing to die, the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. Jerry, you fought the good fight. You ran a great race. You kept the faith. We love you so much, and we will miss you deeply. Well done. Good and My name is Roy Osborne. I'm Jerry and Jeff's stepdad. I asked to speak with you this afternoon because, well, I just thought Jerry would want me to speak for our family. So it's my privilege to do this in his honor. First, let me thank you on behalf of all of our family for coming today and celebrating Jerry's life. Many of you have known Jerry for most of his life, and many of you have come to know him in more recent years new friends, old friends, and family. What we all have in common is that he touched us in some special way that has brought us together to honor his memory and celebrate the person that we love. I want to take some time to say a few things that Barbara and Jeff have asked me to share with you, and I also want to read some special words that David has asked me to share. These are words written by Jerry himself. Lastly, I want to give a few thoughts of my own and read something I gave to Jerry that had meaning for both of us. Barbara has countless good memories of her eldest son, and it was difficult to select any one particular moment or event over another. 
After much thought and discussion, she wanted me to convey the type of man that Jerry grew to be. Jerry had a firm belief in paying it forward. He saw the world through a compassionate filter and never stood idly by when he believed he could do something, big or small, that may make someone's life a little better. He would often stop on the way to work and give his lunch to a homeless person. Maybe not life-changing, but do we really know what that particular gesture may have sparked on that day? At the end of October 2014, we all went to Santa Fe, New Mexico for Jerry and David's wedding on November the 1st. The first evening, Jerry, David, Barb, and I, Jeff had not yet arrived, were at a local restaurant for dinner when a man with two young children was seated near us. We observed the man help his children get settled and help them order something from the menu. The children were so well behaved and the man's gentle approach was something we all commented on. Momentarily, Jerry excused himself and returned in a few minutes. As you might expect, his mom knew exactly where he had been and what he had done. Dinner was bought for the man and his children with no thought or expectation of acknowledgement or reward. Jerry was just paying it forward. And just so you know, a similar thing occurred one morning when we were at breakfast. An elderly lady that was probably homeless was seated at the counter of the restaurant. The waiter was called over and a breakfast was purchased. This time Jeff was the man that paid it forward, not knowing what his brother had done at that dinner. What can I tell you, just two good men that are brothers with big hearts and a love for each other as only brothers can that practice paying it forward. While I was sitting with Jerry, as sick and weak as he had become, I had another opportunity to witness him thinking of someone else and what he could do to pay it forward. Jerry's cousin, Tim Holland, had been in for a visit earlier in the day. As Tim was leaving to return home, Jerry realized he was leaving and called out to give Tim a small green stone for Tim's young son, Austin. Jerry said the stone symbolized adventure. Jerry knew that Austin is an adventurous soul and the stone would have meaning. I'm sure Austin will never forget where that green stone came from. Later, we found out that Austin sent a stone back to Jerry that had meaning for him. He wanted Jerry to take it to heaven with him. Austin has already learned about paying it forward. If you want to honor Jerry, pay it forward. You never know what your kindness may do for a stranger or even a friend or family member. This will keep Jerry's memory alive in our hearts and in our minds. Journals were not a new thing for Jerry. He kept journals for many years chronicling his journey through life. This time was different though. This was about an unexpected journey to an unknown place. David has made some selections for me to read with you and has also written a brief preamble to each selection to give us an idea of the circumstance at the time of the writing. Bear with me as we go through a few of his writings. Jerry was diagnosed with advanced stage colon cancer at the age of 42 in September of 2012. As with any life-threatening illness, the diagnosis was devastating, overwhelming, but at the same time transformative. Jerry began a journal that he kept throughout his journey, and perhaps the most powerful words that can be said about it, his experience are his own. His ability to embrace life and to maintain hope was a constant theme throughout his battle with cancer, and was a common thread that was highlighted in this journal. Less than a month after his diagnosis, Jerry wrote the following. It's dated September the 30th of 12. Reflecting this morning on the past 30 days or so, there is one thing that has had immense and overwhelming impact on me, human kindness. In moments of fear, worry, sadness, and anger, there are these moments of kindness that have humbled me and taken my breath away. I'm a mental health professional. Seems I should have had a better understanding of this. But what I have given in many circumstances I have not had the cause to receive in a real and powerful way until now. 
This is one thing that will changed in, be changed in me forever when this process is over. Cancer sucks. I, you've heard that before. <laughs> Cancer sucks. I would not wish this on me or anyone else. But having a time in life when I am aware of how many people love me and care about me and value me, that is humbling and wonderful and magical. I want to have many years ahead to use this experience, use this knowledge to impact others in my work, in my family, in my social circles, in my random interactions with humanity every day. Prior to his diagnosis, Jerry had never really experienced any major health issue and had never had a stay in the hospital. In the months following, he underwent two separate rounds of radiation and chemotherapy and a major surgery to remove the cancer. By the summer of 2013, the treatment was successful, but there was always the looming possibility of a recurrence. Jerry writes, dated June the 7th of 13. I think hope is a choice, but it is not a one-time only choice. You have to choose it again and again. There may be seasons when you need to ponder on the negative possibilities, when you need to think about less than best case scenarios, but then you have to move on to hope. This whole damn thing is just too hard without it. I have to believe I can beat this. I have to believe I can be cancer free. I have to believe that God and the universe has a purpose for my life post cancer that I'm working towards. And I do believe those things. I also know that people die. They die of cancer and in plane crashes and in shootings and of heart attacks and in car wrecks. And most of them don't expect it. There are stories in the news every day of children and young people and parents and newlyweds and others who died who surely didn't think their time was up. And this is where the crux is. This is where the work of balance and perspective resides to recognize that life is fragile, fleeting, unpromised, and temporal, and fully invest in your life with hope and joy and love. To live your moments in joy and hope and peace instead of fear. By that fall, it was evident that there was residual cancer and that Jerry was experiencing a recurrence. For him, this news was as hard to take as the initial diagnosis. As with anyone, he was crushed, yet never did he express anger or bitterness. As best he could, he reached inward, outward, and toward God to fully live his life. Dated November the 20th of 13. Final question. Have I been angry with God and the universe for cancer? I think the answer to that is still no. I can be angry at the cancer and want to kill it but I don't believe God caused it to happen. It is not a punishment, a test, act of God's will or trial. It is a random disease. It could be something that takes my life, something will eventually, and that is true of all of us. It could also be something that I look back on decades from now and appreciate for its transformative power, but that is up to me. That is not some things happen for a reason, God is in control, truth. Whether or not I emerge from this and grow from this is up to me. I'm working on it. Beginning in January of 2014, Jerry underwent four consecutive rounds of chemotherapy to control the growth of cancer that endured for almost the entire year. During all of it, he lived life to the fullest. Jerry worked full-time, developed new initiatives to expand the services of track. Jerry and David traveled, joined this church, and in November got married. Jerry's love of life was huge, and everyone who was around him felt energized by his spirit. Throughout his journal, he would end his daily entry with a prayer. This is one such prayer he wrote the day after his last birthday, April the 30th, 2014. God, universe, spirits, ancestors, angels, thank you for yesterday. Thank you for the outpouring of love that I felt all day. 
Thank you for the special people in my life and the ability to see their love and feel it in my heart. I am blessed to be so loved, and I am grateful for it. Thank you for the news that we think treatment is helping. Thank you for a chain of communication that made me feel hopeful and positive. I pray for continued good news about treatment and continued success. I want to live, I want to live, I want to live. If that means living with cancer, I will do my best to embrace that. Please give me strength, courage, and hope. Amen. Perhaps this can be all summed up by a text that Jeff sent to his mom, David, and me on Thursday. Jeff says, was looking through my text with bro and found this one. He was an amazing person. Jerry wrote, I just try to live. That's all we can do. Life is beautiful and meant to be lived. Fear and worry will rob us of that. Jerry and his family are deeply grateful to his treatment team. In particular, we would like to thank Dr. Wilson, Dr. Meyer, and Dr. Carroza for their excellent care of Jerry. Jerry felt immense encouragement and support by the entire team at the Simmons Cancer Center and by the wonderful nurses in the chemotherapy department, particularly Carrie Gardner. Finally, we are sincerely grateful to you, our friends and family, for your love and support of Jerry and of us through this journey. David, Barbara, <coughs> excuse me. Barbara, Jeff, and I want to thank you for the love, devotion, and caring that you and Jerry shared. He truly found his soulmate when when you found each other. We know that Jerry could not have had better care over the last two and a half years, and we are grateful. We could not have asked for a better brother-in-law and son-in-law than you. Never forget that your place in this family is secure and that we love you, and everyone in this sanctuary loves you. As you can tell from these things I've read to you, words and deeds were important to Jerry. His words will live on and his deeds will not be forgotten. I was privileged to spend some time with Jerry in his last hours. We talked of many things. Memories were shared and peace was made. As sad as it was, it was also a time for us to share a smile and a laugh. Jerry apologized for not being around to help take care of me when I'm 85. <laughs> I don't know how he picked 85, but he did. I told him that it was okay, and I'd try not to be too big a pain in the butt to Jeff and David. <laughs> Jeff, David, I said I'd try. <laughs> Didn't say I would, and I don't make any promises for Barbara either. I asked that Jerry look in on us every now and then as time permitted. So don't be surprised if you hear a voice in your mind now and again giving you some direction to your particular dilemma that you, you may be having at that moment. You may even hear someone laughing with you at a particularly good moment. Barb, what you hear is mom, and then the appropriate thought will come to you as needed. I will close with a poem that I shared with Jerry several months ago. I heard it referenced in a movie one day I was watching called Act of Valor. I was touched by the words, and I felt compelled to seek out this poem and share it with Jerry. I remember his response. What a beautiful way to look at life. This was written by Chief Tecumseh, a Native American Shawnee chief who lived from 1768 to 1813. So live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion. Respect others in their view and demand that they respect yours. Love your life, perfect your life, beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over the great divide. Always give a word or a sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend 
even a stranger, when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Abuse no one and no thing, for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision. When it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death, so that when their time comes they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. Jerry, you are our hero and you are home. Before I give our closing prayer, um, I want to again say thank you for being here and being a part of this celebration and witness of Jerry's life. Um, immediately following the prayer, there will not be a recessional. You will be dismissed and you're free to go or you're free to stay and, and speak to the family. So I want to invite you to stand, stand for this closing prayer. Let us pray. God of us all, your love never ends. When all else fails, you still are God. We pray to you for one another in our need and for all anywhere who mourn with us this day. To those who doubt, give light. To those who are weak, strength. To all who have sinned, mercy. To all who sorrow, your peace. Keep true in us the love with which we hold one another. In all our ways, we trust you. O oh God, all that you have given us is yours. At first, you gave Jerry to us. And so now, we give Jerry back to you. Receive him into the arms of your mercy. Raise Jerry up with all your people. Receive us also and raise us into a new life. Help us so to love and serve you in this world that we may enter into your joy in the world to come. God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us, even to this day, for the gift of joy and days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and for friends, for our baptism, for our place in your church, with all who have faithfully lived and died. And above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for us. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.